Okay, bismillah walhamdulillah wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala. <clears throat> How many people here heard the term woke? Okay, keep your hands up if you think you're woke. Oh. <laughs> How many people heard the term based? Keep your hands up if you think you're based. Right? Interesting, these terms... <clears throat> They're constantly changing, right? <clears throat> Our political atmosphere is constantly changing. And the, the idea of <clears throat> who's, the, who's the moral person out there, right? Who's standing on their two feet? Who's the progressive? Who's the backwards? And what, what, what do all these things mean? How do you as a Muslim articulate in your own terms, right? In terms that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to us in the Quran, what it means to be moral. Let's start by looking at Surah Shu'ara, <clears throat> which is a surah that talks about <clears throat> several stories of prophets in the Quran. It's interesting, they all have the same call, the same call of Tawheed. <inaudible> they all tell their people, worship one God, you have no God but Him. But they reject, and as they reject, <clears throat> the morality becomes very fluid. As they fall into shirk, right? They fall into all kinds of different immorality. You have the people of Noah, and they have like this classist like response to Noah. Are we gonna believe in you and these people, the lower class of society? Right? The Ad, they're called to by their by their prophet Hud. <clears throat> and Ad was they were just a uh, tyrannical people. They they were so extravagant. Their immorality was their extravagance. And you, you know, he, he calls them and he tells them, Do you build a, 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 a statue on every hill and mansions as if you're going to live forever? And you're, you're tyrants. When you go after people, you go after them like tyrants, right? That was their immorality. The people of Shu'ib, the people of Madian, they rejected Tawheed, so they fell into financial immorality. They were financially very predatory people. And Shu'aib has to tell them, Give people their due measure. And don't come up short when you deal with people tra within their transactions. And the people of Lut, which is somewhat, it seems like, the focus of this panel, right? They fell into another kind of immor sexual immorality. Lut calls them, are you going to approach men of all people and leave the spouses that Allah created for you? Look, here's the point. The point is, all immorality stems from a lack of tawheed. That's the first principle we need to establish. All morality stems from tawheed and all immorality stems from shirk. And this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when he tells us about true morality in the Qur'an, in a beautiful term where this is described in the Qur'an, Surah Baqarah, is the term bir. We have to understand these concepts in our own terms as Muslims. Not terms like woke and base and all this stuff which is thrown at us, but we need to frame this, this discussion in our own understanding, right? Bir is something that encompasses all aspects of morality. Goodness, authenticity, piety, right? fulfilling your oath, being good to your parents, all these different things, they all fall under the idea of birr. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لَيْسَ الْبِرَّ Birr is not أَن تُوَلُّ وُجُوهَكُمْ قِبْلَ الْمَشْرِقِ وَالْمَغْرِبِ It's not that you just turn your face to the east or west. It's not, it's not some superficial religious thing that you do and that's it. First of all, it begins with belief, with tawheed. Remember we said that's where all morality comes from. وَلَكِنَّ الْبَرْ مَنْ آمَنَ بِاللَّهِ وَالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ وَالْمَلَائِكَةِ وَالْكِتَابِ وَالنَّبِيِّينَ Real morality, first and foremost, is believing in God. Believing in His prophets, believing in His angels, believing in His books, believing in the day of judgment, because you know there's accountability coming. That's where real morality stems from, right? And then it's not just belief. When this belief is internalized and inculcated, 
and then it externalizes in the form of action, you begin to see the fruits of morality. It's, it's giving charity to the people in need, to the wayfarer, to the traveler, to the relative, to freeing a slave, establishing prayer, giving zakat. Fulfilling your oaths. When you say you're going to do something, you do it. And people being patient. Difficult times, in the heat of battle, right? That's real morality, right? And it's intertwined between belief and action. You take the one away, the other becomes very fluid. Now, Allah didn't just leave us to figure this out on our own, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us a head start. And this is very important. When you give people da'wah, when you talk to them, <clears throat> tell them what they already know. We know intuitively that there's a God. This is what Allah tells us in the Quran, that in the celestial realm before human beings came into this earth, He took a witness from all of the souls of all of humanity and said, Alastu bi rabbikum, qalu bala, am I not your Lord? And every single soul that ever existed said, yes. We took this witness from you, so you wouldn't come on the day of judgment and say, I didn't know there was a God. No, everyone has it imprinted in their souls. So we know where morality comes from. We also know intuitively, it's printed in our soul, we know what it is, intuitively. You know what good is intuitively. You know what's good to hold the door for someone. You know what's good to be good to your parents, right? Where would that come from? God imprinted it in the souls as well. When he said that he gave inspiration to the soul to understand common sense, what is good and what is bad. So look here, we know where morality comes from and we know it's imprinted in our souls. We know what it is and it's imprinted in our souls. But not just that, Allah didn't leave us there. Allah also gave us an understanding of how to act in accordance with it. And this is what Islam calls the fitrah. It's very important for yourself and for the purpose of da'wah. Understanding this concept. Who's heard of this concept, fitrah? Who's heard of this term before? It's very important. What is it? Fitrat Allahi lati fatran nasa alayha. This is the fitrah that Allah has put all humankind on. This is the natural disposition we have as human beings to recognize the oneness of God and to act good. That's what fitrah is. Nidam, Ibn Ashur, the famous mufassir, the Tunisian mufassir, he says, Nidam awjad Allahu fi kulli makhluq. This is a system Allah has put every living thing on. Everything has a fitrah, right? And you know what? Social scientists know this as well. There's a very interesting book I highly recommend you get and read. It's called Born Believers by a psychologist named Justin Barrett. You know, he's actually agnostic. But you know, he made an observation. And just like Brother Jaweed was saying earlier about the child who asked questions about God, kids four or five years old, even if they're never taught about religion, they seem to intuitively have questions about God. And he's like, how could that be? Where did this come from, right? And so <clears throat> he shows all these experiments and you know, all these different things that they do, the psychologists, anthropologists, and they, you know, they come up with these fancy terms. They come up with this term called had hyperactive, hyperagency detection device. <laughs> like a child, a child sees like a toy, it's like, oh, okay, who did that? It must have been an agent behind this. They hear a noise. Oh, where'd that come from? I didn't do it. There's some agency behind this, right? They get a little bit older, they see a mountain. Wow, who did that? Who's the, who's the super agent behind this, right? Intuitively, you know, this is fitrah. Call it what you want, but this is fitrah, right? <clears throat> And so intuitively we have these things, and we know these things, right? We know where morality comes from, we know what it is, and we know based on fitrah how to act in accordance to it. And then the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has embodied, symbolized, right? And exemplified in the best of character, uswatun hasana, how to practically live that. So here's the second important principle when it comes to morality. This is what Allah says in the Quran. وَمَا كَانَ لِمُؤْمِنٍ وَلَا مُؤْمِنَةٍ إِذَا قَضَى اللَّهُ أَمْرًا أَنْ يَكُونَ لَهُمُ الْخِيَارَةُ مِنْ أَمْرِهِمْ It is not for the believing man or woman when Allah has decreed a matter that they have any say in it. 
submission. Submission. Right? We do not get to choose our morality. This is a big difference in the liberal society that we live in. Now, this fitrah, this is something, if you're not careful, again, you're born on the right, this is what the Prophet Muhammad says, Kullu mawludin ala fitrah. every child is born on fitrah, right? You're born on this natural disposition to understand and live out morality the way it's supposed to be, right? But it can change. It's not solid, it's plastic, right? It's malleable. What causes it to change? The environment, right? <clears throat> Ibn Ashur, going back to this famous uh, Tunisian Mufassir, in the verse that I mentioned in Surah Rum, verse number 30, where Allah says, Fitrat Allah illati fatara nasa ahali. This is the natural way that God has created humankind on. He talks about the word fitra. And he says this, Inna al mujtama al insani qad muni asuran tawilatan bi awhamin wa awaidin wa ma'lufat. Ad khalaha ahlu tadlil. People live in societies, and over time, the influencers in society who influence you in a long way, over time they make you get used to norms that are not good, right? And these norms that are not good, they mix with things that may be good. So you have a mix of things that are good and not good. People talk about them, eventually they get used to them. They, it, it, becomes a part of your psyche, these norms that we live with, these terms that we live with, right? These, these uh, uh, understandings of what's okay and what are real rights and whatnot, they become a part of your psyche to the point that it gets stuck to your head like a spider on a spider web. And it's hard to unstuck your head from these ideas and norms that are all around us that may not be in line with Islamic morality, right? Ibn Sina, he says in his book, Najat, he talks about adha'iyat, which are trends in society. He says, these trends, they could influence you in thinking about, okay, well, maybe this is normal, maybe that's... But he says, if they don't fall under common sense, right? If it's not from uli al if it's not from common sense, فَلَيْسَ مِنَ fitra. It's never from fitra, right? So here's the thing. Society, through subtle mental adjustments, right, can get you to get used to certain things that may not be normal, may not be moral, but over time you just get you. It's the water we swim in, right? <clears throat> and it's hard to unstuck our brains from those things. Let me just give you an example, okay? I'm a physician. How in the world did it get normal to chemically castrate a 10-year-old boy because he's confused about his gender? How in the world did it get normal? Did it become a trend? Did people start to think that this is normal, this is moral, to render an 11-year-old girl never able to have kids again because she's confused about her gender, right? This is society losing its understanding of morality. Morality has become too fluid. It's not based in those things that we said it has to be based in, which is tawheed, right? And the example of the Prophet Muhammad in fitrah. That happens on a societal level. But you know what's really dangerous? It can also change. This fitrah can also change because of sins. Sins that people commit, Right? The fitra can change because, and this is what the Prophet Muhammad tells us in a hadith. Temptations will come to you as a human being and it will hit your heart over and over and over again. Right? Any heart that refuses the temptation a light will be struck within it. And any heart that gives in to that temptation, a darkness will start to come into it until you get two types of hearts. One heart that is pure, full of light. No amount of temptation can hurt that heart, right? But another one, the one, the person who keeps falling into sin, never repents, right? Listen to what he says and see, look at how this is related to morality. He says, that person, that heart becomes aswad, 
Murbadan, something in between black and like a dark sand color. Kalkuzi Mujachian, like a flipped cup. Why does he say flipped cup? Because the heart is supposed to hold Marifa, knowledge of God. That knowledge of God is what guides you to what is right and wrong. A flipped cup cannot hold anything. The heart that is flipped like this in this example has lost all of the ma'rifa, all of the knowledge of God has fallen out. And so you know what he says, what happens after that? لا يعرف معروفا ولا ينكر منكرا. It doesn't see good as good and it doesn't see evil as evil. It begins to see good as bad and bad as good. And that is fluid morality. And then he says this at the end of the hadith. إلا من أشرب من هواء. Except whatever his desire tells him. In other words, it gets to a point, once you leave Tawheed, and you, all you do is commit sin, your fitrah change, your heart can no longer hold this ma'rifa. To the point that the only thing that tells you what is good is whatever your desire is. That's it. And this is why the last component of morality that's so important is the aqal. This aql, this intellect that God gave us, which is for reason and reflection, but also restraint. Like the Prophet's hadith about the camel, tie your camel, aqilha wa tawakkal ala Allah. Right? We're supposed to, the aqal is literally the leash. We're supposed to have a leash on our hawa, on our desires, and pull that back when it's not appropriate. Self control which is something society is losing by the day, right? <clears throat> this is also a very important part of morality. And when we sum it all together, all of the stuff we mentioned, tawheed, right? Ilham of the nafs and what its understanding of what right and wrong is. Fitra, right? The natural disposition to do what is good. And aqal, restraint, right? These four things all of Islamic morality hover and, and kind of revolve around these four things. And the Sharia is nothing but a practical way for us to put this into our daily lives. This is thabit morality. What does thabit mean? Based, solid, unchanging, right? Like the Prophet asked for hearts that are thabit. You know the, you know the hadith. Ya muqalb al qulub, thabit qulubana ala dinik. O flipper of the hearts, make our hearts thabit, based, rooted. Like the tree that's rooted in the ground. Aslu ha thabit, wa far'u ha fi sama. Right? The parable of faith. And its branches, its, its, its roots are rooted, its branches pierce into the sky. So what does it do? Tu'ti uklaha kulla hini bi idni rabbi. It gives its fruit at all times. When your heart is thabit and your morals are thabit, you know what you get then? Your feet become thabit. This is a very important metaphor in the Quran. Tathbitul aqadam. Wa thabit aqadamana. That metaphor is used in the Quran over and over again to say someone whose feet are well planted is someone who does not get uprooted by the changing norms of society. There's someone who, when there's a tornado of desires and changing norms, they don't just change with it, they stay based. Right? So that is very important. But the project of secularism, <clears throat> five minutes? One minute? <laughs> I'm halfway done. <laughs> The project of secularism wants to undo this leash. It wants to undo this vertical anchor, this habdullah, this rope of God, right? So that you're left to your own devices. And I would highly recommend a book, I don't have time to go into it, but a book by um, uh, a person by the name of um, Carl Truman who wrote um, Strange New World. He literally goes through how this has changed over a period of the last 400 years, right? <clears throat> and who are the philosophers and thinkers who have been a part of the social imaginary that have slowly, like a virus, allowed these values to change and evolve over time such that it's reached this Frankenstein-like level that it's gotten to today, right? What we need to do <clears throat> as Muslims 
is understand, and I'm just going to end on this, <clears throat> that we cannot just go with the flow of society because the flow is too fluid. We have to be, like the Quran says, the Hunafa. The Hanif is someone who constantly inclines towards good and avoids the temptations of just going with the flow. It's the harder thing to do. But to maintain your morality as a Muslim, it is extremely important, right? So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us tawfiq. <clears throat> we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us people of adab, people of morality, people whose hearts are thabit, whose, whose roots of iman are thabit, whose feet are thabit, people who don't just go with the flow, but at times may go against the flow, right? Because that is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala demands of us. <clears throat> قُلِ قَوْلِ هَذَا وَاسْتَغْفِرُ اللَّهِ فَاسْتَغْفِرُهُ إِنَّهُ كَانَ غَفْرًا